I was recently surprised to discover that the word scrum half is in the Oxford English Language Dictionary. I was even more surprised to learn that the definition read like this rather than this. Now, they're billed as the link between the forwards and the backs, but in truth, the scrum half position in top flight rugby is just short man syndrome turned into a profession. Now, despite being very not big myself, I was never a natural fit for the scrum half position because... I'm comfortable with my height, and even the tall ones are classic sufferers of Napoleon complex. Scrum half is a position for people who take no comfort in the fact they can just about get on all the rise at Olden Towers. And the best ones come from those who, on the playground, realise they'd never be able to beat that kid up. So instead, they'll just have to get so, so, so much better at everything else in the world in order to get their own back. It's a bit like how all the best props come from kids who decided early on they'd rather find a way of using their weight than go to the gym and stop eating treacle. Even though he grew to be a glorious six foot two, it's arguably the spirit of a childhood short ass that led Conor Murray to become perhaps the most effective scrum half in the world. Whilst there are other scrum halves who are as good as him, there are none as well deployed by their team. Murray's become the absolute cornerstone of everything Joe Smith's Island does. These days, they almost play like a team trying to enable Murray. The entire game plan is seemingly built on playing to his strengths. As such, if we want any insight into why Ireland are as effective as they are, we need to first ask the same question about Conor Murray. Early in his career, Murray was referred to as a kind of Irish Mike Phillips. And for the first few years, he was one fight with a McDonald's bouncer away from that being fair. But over the last five years, Murray has flourished into a significantly more intelligent player than Phillips ever was. Now, rugby is not a simple game, and you know that because if it was, Americans might watch it. And yet Conor Murray has an incredible knack for being on top of every single element going on at once, no matter how quick the game. He's excellent at organising his team, communicating clearly, getting his teammates into positions he wants them to be in. Look at this clip. Even though he was at the bottom of the previous ruck, he's so fixated on managing his team's shape. He hits wicked stepmother levels of not letting anyone go near the ball. Just as well too, because a few moments later he scores himself. Whilst he bursts through the gap like a man on his way to the hot cake shop, these tries are more about Murray's speed of thought than foot. Blocks similar to these occur hundreds of times per game, but Murray spots it right away, in the half second in which he can exploit it. In the rest of that second, he notices that his opposite number's eyes are on Sexton, not him. He processes this very quickly, and he's through! Murray snipes around the fringes very often, which means defenders can't afford to drift at all. They have to commit tight to the ruck to try and prevent him from using his freakishly large scrum half frame to pop the ball over the line, which, of course, leads to other chances out wider. With some scrum halves, this is about greed. With Murray, it's calculated. Murray's speed of thought and ability to scan the width and depth of the field is almost unparalleled. This try from 2014 is perhaps my favourite demonstration of what I'm going to call Murrayism. It's one of the sharpest, smartest pieces of play I've ever seen in a rugby pitch. It's such an impressive piece of play. I genuinely don't think anything can ruin the sheer intelligence of what Murray does. So, to test this theory to its limits, instead of talking about the try, I'm instead going to read an extract of my new rugby slash fiction. It had been a record eight months since Wales last played Australia, and Israel for Loud felt every second of it pass. At points, it felt as though he would never see his Valley Prince Charming again. He would spend his days dreaming about his welcome as he would comb over, and nights about his underrated handling skills. He had never felt this way towards a second row before, but this was different. This was love. The two teams took the field. Falau's usually safe hands trembled at the prospect of seeing his tall, taft dreamboat again. He had to say something. Just being handed off by him last time was the thrill of Falau's young gay life. Mr. Wynne Jones, I just... Bonnie Mine's personal demigod cut him off. It's just Jones. Alan Wynne is my first name. Murray had 1.52 seconds to identify this. Make the decision and then make the kick. 1.52 seconds. Let me put that in context. I buy the same brand of bread every time. And yet it still takes me longer than that to choose a loaf, pull it off the shelf and put it in my basket. And it's not just 1.52 seconds. It's 1.52 seconds with a bunch of burly South African forwards up in your face. I drop the bread. I drop the bread and run. But Murray doesn't drop the bread or the ball, neither literally or figuratively. It's a perfect kick. But of course it is. He's the best box kicker in the world. Not only is his boot incredibly accurate and powerful, he gets an amazing amount of hang time on each kick, allowing his teammates to contest for the ball. Even if they can't outjump the opposition and win it outright, it gives them the perfect opportunity to put pressure on. Sometimes this may lead to a fumble or a turnover, but even if not, it means Ireland can clear the ball without worrying about triggering a counter-attack. He's also an amazingly versatile kicker for a nine. He's equally adept at more standard clearances, chips, scrubbers, cross kicks, even goal kicking from long and short range. This means that even when a defence sees Murray shaping the kick, they don't know what he's going to do. 
The other area Murray excels at is managing a game. For a 10, typically this just means striking an effective balance between kick, run and pass. For a scrum half, there are far more options. It's varying the direction and distance of the play. No matter who the fly off is, if you're spinning the ball wide to your 10 every phase, it becomes very easy to defend. Likewise, if you're using pods constantly, defence knows what you're doing. By equally looking left and right, wide and short, looking to bring in the back three on strike moves on inside balls, looking to use forwards, Murray forces the defensive line to stay flat and even. What Murray does makes defences think. And as anyone who watched that Weakest Link special knows... Andy, in cinema, the 2009 film title that ends with the words Half-Blood Prince begins with the name of which schoolboy wizard? Wizard of Oz. Professional rugby players find thinking exhausting. Now, both Scotland and Ireland are incredibly patient teams, but it's the difference between the kind of patience involved in sitting for a three-hour metaphysics lecture and a Transformers movie. You can drop a winger or a hooker into almost any game plan, but your halfbacks dictate the way you play. As such, Ireland's play is built entirely around Murray. You remember when Wings dropped the pretense and renamed themselves Paul McCartney and Wings? Murray's become so crucial to the side, I feel they need to stop lying to everyone as well and rebrand as Connor Murray and the Irish national rugby team. The way they play is niggly and combative and relies on frustrating the opposition then taking the chances created by the mistakes this makes them make. That's how Murray plays. Unlike Phillips, who was such a prick the opposition couldn't help but want to break ranks to smash him, Murray still gets in your face, but he keeps his discipline. He was the only one of the six starting scrum halves not penalised on the opening round of the Six Nations. The worst thing for Wales this weekend and then Scotland and in England in the weekends to come, is that it's basically impossible to stop. How do you prevent someone just doing the basics really well? Whenever there's the threat of someone interrupting his game, Murray has the great habit of calling in forwards to protect him, sacrificing blows to his big pawns instead of risking a scratch on his own kingly frame. The fact of the matter is, the only way to best Murray is to better Murray, to beat him at the game he worked so hard to make his own to play smarter than him, to think quicker than him, to execute more efficiently than him. Considering his opposite number on Saturday has the brain capacity of a bowl of custard, the speed it takes to make decisions might not be a problem, but what those decisions are certainly will be. Instead of worrying how to stop him, you just have to go out and play, whilst always admiring Murray for being that rarest of things amongst scrum halves. A halfback who puts the ball into the scrum, and not a twat. Now, I understand the video is getting shorter, but, you know, so is my life, so I hope you forgive me. Equally, I understand that your life is also getting shorter, not to go morbid for a second. Um, but I do understand, therefore, if you don't want to do the whole like, subscribe thing, that's that's fine. I wouldn't expect you to. I wouldn't ask you to. Um, though, I mean, if you do, if anyone does have any ideas for things they'd want me to talk about a bit, um, rugby-wise, you know, I'd appreciate if you could send them to me so that I could then ignore them and do them on something else instead. Otherwise... I hope you have a lovely week or two until I do a next one, and I'll see you then. Bye.